Well, it's not too bad for a seven-year-old machine. This is my very first forklift. I ended up trading a snowmobile for it. 99 Polaris XC700. Thing needed a bunch of work, so I ended up trading it straight up for this forklift. I think it did pretty darn good for a running, driving forklift, even though it is 70 years old. It's quite old, but they don't make things like they used to, and uh, they built these old Clark forklifts. They built them to last forever. And this thing was actually built during World War II. As far as the motor goes, it's got an old Continental flathead four-cylinder. Um, you cannot kill these motors. They say there's motors out there 70, 80 years old with not even a score in the cylinders. 90% of the time, all they need is a head gasket because the head warps over time or the head studs end up stretching over time, which is understandable. But as far as the block, the cylinders, the pistons, and all the bearings inside the motor, I guess they just, they just never wear out. They just last forever. Um, so that's really good. The thing, as you can tell, runs really well. Um, it does have a bad head gasket in it, um, so that is something we're gonna have to address. You can see that based by the coolant overflowing here from the radiator cap. This is all coolant right here. It blows out the coolant once it starts getting warm. So it definitely needs a head gasket. This is about a 5,500 pound machine, so it's not a light machine. And uh, it took me a little bit of work to get it in here because of the ramp that I got going on right now on my one entrance. Um, I would have drove it down the driveway over here because there would be no ramp, but I don't have that driveway made yet. So I ended up having to pull it in here with my Cummins and my buddy's 9,000 pound winch. And we ended up driving this thing up onto some heavy mats and we ended up towing it in that way. But yeah, we got it up in here and now it's time to go through the thing. From what I've seen in the specs, this thing will lift about 4,000 pounds, I think. Definitely pretty impressive giving its size, how much it can lift. And a lot of these forklifts are like that. You know, they're very compact, but they can lift a ton because of all the rear ballast they have on them. You know, they got the solid cast or solid steel uh, back weight here which I wouldn't want to remove that because you're going to need a very heavy machine to get that off. It's also got the side weights right here, as you can see, right above the uh, back wheel wells. Uh, these weights are often missing, I've seen, on a lot of the machines online. Um, so I'm really glad that mine has these on there. It's got them on both sides. Nobody ever stripped them off of it. Um, this thing does have some access panels. You can see here, we can take out this top panel here where the controls are to get up underneath it and to get to the transmission, which is right here. Uh, it's got some side panels here so you can get into the transmission, work on a brake system and all that. And then as far as the top goes, I believe I have to take off the fuel tank. This is just like a cover right here. And then the fuel tank is underneath it because this is a gas machine. It's not a propane machine. And then they also have a cover right here, which is the last cover I'm gonna take off. I'm hoping I don't have to take this off just because I have a feeling some of these bolts might snap. But that being said, I've had this forklift for about three weeks now and I've been waiting to do a video on it before I did any serious work to it. The only things that I've done to it is I got a new radiator cap. It's a non-vented cooling system, so you do not have a vent in the radiator cap. When the coolant expands, it ends up just dripping out a drip tube onto the ground. That's how they had them back in the day. I did end up buying a battery for it, as you can see here. This was a six volt system and somebody had converted it over very sloppily, I must say, because there's wires and stuff hanging out all over the place, which we're gonna address that. But someone did at one point convert this to 12 volt. So I did buy a 12 volt battery. I ended up picking this up at Tractor Supply and I was able to find the long style battery um, shaped more like a six volt battery back in the day for it to fit in this battery pocket right here. Um, so I was super happy about that because I didn't think I'd ever find a battery that would fit this pocket. So this is a 12 volt battery and it is currently on a 12 volt system. I'm not too sure all that what they did. I know it's got the original starter in it. So hopefully that'll be okay. So far it seems to be fine. Um, this right here looks like a Chrysler alternator. Um, looks like a one or two wire alternator. Um, so we're gonna have to check into that. I don't believe this has an internal voltage regulator. I believe it's got an external voltage regulator. So I'm kind of curious to see if they're using the factory regulator or not, because I don't think they'd be able to use the factory regulator being that it was for six volt. Curious to kind of see what's going on with that and how they got that wired. But other than that, that's the only things I've done to it. Now this specific Clark model is called a Clark car loader. I believe it was built from 1942 to 1964. That was the year range for the model that we got right here in front of us. I believe mine to be a 1950s model early 50s or late 40s, um, just based by what I've seen on pictures online and how things are made on this. I believe the steering wheel could have had a wooden steering wheel on it. I don't know now because it's broken off, which I do have to get a new steering wheel for it. And based on the seat, which if this is the original seat, um, just based on the style of this whole thing, I, I'd have to say it's pretty old, probably in the 50s. Um, when I went and looked at it, the first thing I looked for was if the cylinders were leaking, because I know that some of these hydraulic cylinders are very expensive to rebuild, and I know they're really hard to get parts for. So that was the first thing I looked for. And as you can see here, our main cylinder here has got no leaks on it, which I was really surprised to see. It's got no leaks on the bottom as well. And then the curl or dump cylinders, whatever you want to call them, um, those are not leaking either. You got one under each one of these little floor pans. 
one here and one over there and I've checked those out and they're not leaking either, which is very surprising given its age. The tires are obviously shot. The front one's got a bunch of rips and stuff in them and on the back tires, there's actually some really huge chunks missing out of them to where when I drive it, I can kind of feel it hitting the flat spots of the tires. So at some point, if I end up keeping this, the rear tires will have to get done and maybe the front tires as well, depending on what I end up using this thing for. So now let's talk about what is wrong with this machine that I could find so far and what I plan on replacing or fixing. So the first thing is the wiring, obviously. I need to get in here and fix all the wiring. And while I'm in here fixing the wiring, redoing everything, I'm gonna end up putting a fuse panel in here a little fuse box because back in the day they did not use fuses so i just want to kind of protect it and that way if something shorts out i could always just replace a fuse instead of having this thing burned down so i plan on mount a little fuse box somewhere around here like this plate right here and i also have a nice 100 amp fuse for the main power lead that way that is fused as well while i got everything apart i'm also going to replace the head gasket because that is leaking and i'll show you guys that a little bit later and hopefully the head is not warped but i will check it to make sure it's true and if not we'll deal with that when we get to it um, the other thing that I know it needs is some carb work. So I don't know what kind of uh, fuel they ran in this, if it was really bad fuel or how long it sat, but it seems to be a little bit gummed up in a carb. So I'm gonna pull this carburetor off and go through it, buy all new O-rings and seals for it, gaskets. And I also noticed that the, the shutoff on the bowl of the carburetor is leaking. Um, so it's leaking gas from that. I don't really see any other oil leaks other than that one gas leak and the fact that it's leaking coolant because it keeps blowing over. Um, other than that, I'm not finding all kinds of oil on the ground or even spots of oil. Um, I had it parked here for a couple days now and when I just backed it up, I didn't see nothing except for the gasoline that came from the carburetor. And you could smell it when you walk in here, you could smell the raw gasoline. I do plan on getting a new steering wheel, like I said. Um, I already took the steering wheel off of it. You can see the nut is loose here so that I can get a shaft diameter and the count on the splines so I could order a new steering wheel for it. So I'm gonna do that. And then coming over to this little cart here, you'll see I got a brand new seat for it. I only paid 90 bucks for the seat on eBay. It's got a nice little armrest, they're fully adjustable. It's got a seat belt on it, and it's also got a forward and backwards adjustment. Even the back leans back and forth. So I thought that was a smoking deal. I mean, it's almost as nice as my Kubota seat, to be honest with you. And uh, for 90 bucks, you can't beat it. I also got this little bus fuse here. This is gonna be going on a positive with the battery terminal, and that way it's protected for 100 amps. That way if the battery cable's ever short out or rub up against something, uh, it's not gonna melt anything down. Also got some new battery cables, as you'll see here, because of the old six volt system. I gotta see exactly what was switched out and what wasn't. Um, I know them six volt cables are really old that are in there. So I'm gonna end up trying to use these. I'll probably cut off a couple of these ends, obviously to put on these ring terminals here um, so that I can connect it all. I also got a new ignition because the ignition is bad in it currently. It does work, but oftentimes you gotta shake it to make it work. And the key is also broken off in the ignition. This ignition I ended up getting off eBay and it's supposed to be brand new old stock. It even has Clark's name written on the key. And um, I believe this to be like a 50s key because it's made exactly like the one that's in there, even the way um, the, the back of it is designed with the way the screws go into it. And uh, that's pretty cool, I think. I did find the original owner's manual. So I looked around on eBay and searched and searched and I finally found this owner's manual here. This is a complete maintenance manual on the old Clark forklifts. Um, my specific forklift, the car loader, um, it goes through all the different series of car loaders that Clark has made. And um, they even show you like pictures in here of uh, the different wheelbases and how to know which model of Clark you have. Um, there's really good illustrations in here talking about everything from the gauges to the cylinder head to the transmission, how to rebuild it, how to fully maintenance it, grease it. Um, they give you the brands of the carburetors, the hydraulic pump and much more. And because this machine is so old, you can see here it says war department. Um, this, this, this manual, I was reading it over and it actually tells you um, how to destroy the forklift if the forklift is gonna get into enemy hands. So basically if they had to leave the forklift behind in World War II, as a lot of air bases use this exact model forklift, um, it said right in the manual basically, if you gotta leave it behind, here's how you destroy it. <laughs> and in the manual it basically says, take a sledgehammer to the cylinder block, um, smash off the uh, distributor and all that. And it said if you have multiple of these to, to make sure that you smash different parts on all the machines so that they can't rob like the distributor block off another one to make this one run and vice versa. So they made sure to put down to smash everything. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny. And if I find it in here, I'll show you guys, but it's really neat reading over this old literature and seeing the old pictures and stuff. 
Um, definitely a lot better than these modern manuals are today, I tell you that much. Very, very detailed. And not only do they give you all the part numbers, but they tell you what each component was made by, who it was made by, all kinds of stuff, man. There's just great, great stuff in here. So all that being said, guys, I think we're gonna dive right into this. The first thing I'm gonna do is try to pull off this, this panel cover right here for the gas tank, remove these side covers and this top cover here so we can get into the guts of this machine so we can start working on it. Let's see how many bolts we can snap off here. Not too bad. And get this choke out of the way. It's probably about where it belonged from factory, but. I could just tell this isn't the original choke. Back on the top side here, got this one bolt. Glad that didn't snap. Now I think this thing will come off. We just get a Get these grommets out of the way. Just slide up, I think. There we go. So this one, I have no idea how it is going to come off. I don't know if this will just pry up and around it. Hmm. Now, I don't know if this thing unscrews. Maybe this whole cap can unscrew. There we go. Oh, we got a nice little screen too. That's always good. Now we should be able to take this off. Perfect. So I'll see if this thing comes off here. Beautiful. Everything we're doing, guys, is for the first time for me as well. So it'll be the first time for both of us. Because like I said, I have not touched this thing. I'm just kind of waiting to do it on video. This looks like the uh, fuel level gauge, which is which actually still works on this machine, believe it or not. All three of the original factory gauges work on this machine, which is pretty mind-boggling. Go ahead and stick this back in. I want to get nothing in the tank here. Okay, so to get full access, it looks like we're gonna have to take this whole fuel tank out of the way, which is pretty much what I expected anyway. so now that we've got the fuel tank out of the way we could take a look at this uh terrible wiring job here so it does look like it's externally regulated um i believe this was done a long time ago because you could just tell by the regulator itself how old it looks and judging by the way it's mounted it's only mounted on the top side i could actually flex this up and down um, there's a tab on the bottom where you can mount it as well so somebody only screwed it into this top hole here so that definitely was not factory um, so I'm going to say that this was done with the 12 volt conversion. So we should be all set to keep this regulator and to keep that alternator the way it is. 
Um, so that's good. I'm just gonna end up cleaning this up and uh, rewiring it all, obviously. And then over here on this side, you can see where the gauges are. The gauges come out here on the back side, which is kind of weird how they did it back then. Um, in the later models, like 60s and 70s, they started making a little column here on the steering wheel, and all the gauges went into that. Um, I debated on making my own little column there, uh, putting some plate steel on there, drilling some holes in it, and moving these gauges in the switch. Um, whether or not I'll do that, I don't know, because I'm not sure how far I want to get into this project, but we'll see. Um, but for now, I think the main objective here is to get to all these wires and rewire it completely uh, because they're still using some of the factory harness. So nobody's been in here for a while. Um, and whoever was in here last had to be a long time ago because I don't understand why you wouldn't get rid of this factory harness. Um, it's cloth backed and um, God only knows if it's asbestos or not. Um, really old stuff. You can see the wires are all just completely down to metal. They're frayed everywhere. Um, Looks like mice have been chewing on it for years. Every single wire in this is split, cut, ripped, torn. Um, you got this wire that's twisted around this bracket here, this yellow wire, for a hanger. So instead of cutting it down and making it the right length, let's just twist it around a bracket and <laughs> take some of the length out of it. So um, I will be getting rid of all these factory wires and we're gonna be going with all new wiring. Um, here's the switch down here dangling. So there's the switch and this is what I had to wiggle around and play with to get it running. Um, and to get it off the trailer. That's the switch we're gonna be replacing with the new one and that goes in this hole right here. So with that being said, uh, now we can get to the wiring. All the wires are pretty much exposed, um, but I wanna continue to tear off these panels so we can get more into it because I'm gonna have to lift the head eventually. So I might as well just get to it now and do that head gasket. Um, and as you can see here, I really don't have enough room. I might be able to squeak it, but it, it's gonna be tight and it's gonna make it hard. It's gonna make it very hard to torque it. Um, I know these old flathead cotton metal motors, um, there's a certain specific torque pattern that you got to do with them. And if you don't do it right, and if you don't retorque it, um, the head gas could end up warping or end up leaking again. So it's very crucial to torque these in a proper order. And they even make new head bolts now for them. They get rid of the head studs and I believe you use head bolts now. They decided to start selling the head gaskets with head bolts instead of head studs because they say they work better on these old heads. What I'm going to try to do now is um, I'm going to take off some of these side panels and stuff. See if we can get the side panel off here as well as the other one. And then I'm going to see exactly how this uh, foot panel comes off. Um, we'll see if we can get off all those panels tonight. And um, maybe I'll get a start on this top panel here, which I'm not too excited to take out because of the linkages that go through it. Them are going to have to be disconnected and they're going to have to come out with the uh, plate here. And as you can see, we're going to have to remove the gauges or at least the wiring to the gauges, the oil line for the oil pressure gauge. Um, the regulator, all that's going to have to come out. And like I said earlier, this entire valve system itself for the forks is going to have to come out or at least get unbolted from the top plate here. And uh, once all that is done, I should be able to unbolt the rest of the plate and just lift the whole thing out. And then I'll have the entire engine bay exposed, which I think is the better way to go because then I could check all the hydraulic lines over, completely service the clutch and the transmission and everything else without having any issues. So with that being said, let's go ahead and start taking off the rest of these side panels. And if we have enough time at the end of the night here, we'll start working on this big top plate here.